Japan could potentially have its first female prime minister. The current leader, Yoshihide Suga, says he intends to step down after just one year on the job. Suga is highly unpopular and says that he will not seek re-election as leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, paving the way for a new PM to take charge of the world's third largest economy. For only the second time in the party's history, a woman is among the contenders. So I want to bring in foreign correspondent Lucy Kraft, who is in Tokyo, to talk a little bit more about this. So there is a bit of excitement about her. Who is this woman who's running for leadership? And... Uh, you know, does she actually have a chance to become the first female prime minister of Japan? Okay, first of all, her name is Sanai Takaichi. She's a 60-year-old politician from Nara Prefecture. That's out in Western Japan. She was elected, she's been elected eight times to the House of Representatives. She's had cabinet posts seven times. And whenever there's a new cabinet formed, you see this sea of dark suits. It's almost all men. And she's usually one of the, the two or three, or sometimes the only woman in the, in the room. Um, her first foray into politics was on Capitol Hill. She actually worked in the office of former Colorado Congresswoman Pat Schroeder, who, as you recall, was a Democrat. Takaichi has since swerved all the way to the ultra-right. There isn't much daylight between her positions and those of her mentor, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who has seems to be throwing his weight behind her candidacy. Um, now, as far as public support goes, uh, Takaichi's trailing way behind her male rivals, but because the prime minister is elected not directly by the public, but by the 700 odd members of the ruling party, it's too early to count her out of this race. Hmm. So the LP, the LDP rather, is the very same party that earlier this year said it would allow five female lawmakers to sit in on its all male board meetings as long as they didn't speak. Uh, so that makes me wonder just how much of an uphill climb uh, this is for, um, you know, not just her, but other women who want to participate in politics in Japan. What is it about Japanese male politicians not letting women speak? It's it's like an allergy or something. <laughs> we had a similar embarrassment with the board of the Olympics, as you might recall earlier this year. The, the crux of the problem is Japan is effectively a one-party state, Anne-Marie, and it's been so since World War II. The ruling conservatives have had this vice-like grip on leadership almost nonstop for the last 70 years. The party, as you pointed out, is the LDP, itself is a gerontocracy. Many of its heavy hitters are in their 80s, and they're unwilling or unable to imagine breaking up the old boys club that can't seem to dig the country out of decades of sluggish growth. So there are real-world consequences to this lack of fresh, diverse leadership. One female legislator, Tomomi Inada, has called her country democracy without women. And many here believe that without some kind of drastic measures, especially gender-based quotas for the legislature, Japan will be doomed to male-dominated politics. Um, you brought up the uh, previous prime minister, Abe, who had introduced a series of policies that were designed to encourage gender equality, womenomics. Um, and kind of the claim to fame for womenomics is an increase in the number of women who are participating in the workforce. The goal was 73 percent. Um, and now, as of 2020, I think, or currently it's 70 percent, I think women uh, took a major hit during the pandemic, just like they did in this country. Um, could <laughs> a woman prime minister accelerate this process, make some real change? Because I think the conclusion when it came to womenomics was that there was some change, but, but the policies just didn't go far enough. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if uh, with this candidate it would make a substantial difference. You know, a majority of women, as you pointed out, are in the labor force. Many of them are stuck in dead-end jobs. They're, they're working behind the cash register at the supermarket or something like that. Part of the problem is the structure of Japanese employment. Large companies typically have a very large annual intake of new employees, usually kids fresh out of college. Even if you're talented, if you're a woman, you decide to have kids, take a few years out of, out of your career, many companies are not interested in hiring you when you return to the workforce. So empowering women is, is not just a matter of equity, by the way. One estimate holds that if women were given full opportunities in society, it would boost GDP by 15%. And don't forget, Japan's workforce is aging and shrinking. It needs all hands on deck and fast. 
Uh, just a quick question, not about womenomics. You know, Shinzo Abe was the country's longest serving prime minister, but his now outgoing successor lasted only a year. Is Japan headed for a new period of maybe a rotating door of prime ministers, uh, uh, as was the case maybe in the mid 2000s? You know, Prime Minister's demise, his, his, he just pancaked so quickly. It was remarkable. He used to instill <laughs> fear in reporters when he served as Abe's left, right-hand man. He was kind of his consigliere. But in recent press conferences especially, he looks beaten down, awkward. The sweat is pouring down his face. Perhaps if Japan hadn't had to endure the stress and divisiveness of hosting the Olympic Games, maybe the vaccinations have been rolled out as promised by June, then Suga might be looking to start a new three-year term instead of just fi finishing up one year in the job. Whether Japan is doomed to revert to these revolving door prime ministers one every year, certainly allies like the U.S. are hoping that the curse is not coming back. Hmm. Lucy Kraft, thank you very much. Thank you.